Hello everyone, Tom McDonald from the CMA and SEMA, and we're here today for a Thursday webinar before uh, what I hope is a very Merry Christmas and Happy New Year for everyone there. Um, today we're incredibly lucky because we have the combination of the Advantage Group and Meyer talking about uh, things that are very important for us in the category management world. And I want to make sure up front that you guys understand that Advantage Report is part of the parent company of Advantage Group International. I got to know Advantage Group International during my time in the UK with Proctor, and they produced some best-in-class reporting that led to retailer and supplier collaboration and benchmarking. They are they are working with many of our larger CPG companies and mid-sized CPG companies. Recently, they were quoted on page nine of Pepsi's annual report talking about the kind of information that they're bringing to bear to help Pepsi go ahead and collaborate better. So we've got um, Don Sanderson, who's the group VP for merchandising for Meyer on the phone, be speaking with them on how they're going ahead and using it. And again, Meyer being ranked the number one major retailer in America for the fifth straight year by the CPG supplier community. So congratulations to Don and the Meyer organization for that. This as always will be an interactive session. If you have questions, please type them in the chat box. We will gently interrupt Mark and Don to go ahead and make sure they get answered. But this should be a real treat for you guys out there and a great learning experience. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mark and to Don. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming on today. Well, thank you, Tom. Uh, this is Mark Hubbard from Advantage Report. And um, I'm thrilled to be with everyone today. I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you. And as Tom said, please do ask questions along the way. Um, just a little bit of, again, to f further background um, on uh, Maya, for those of you that don't know. Uh, Don is the Vice President of Merchandising at Maya, and he'll be sharing a little bit about what he is looking for and the company's looking for from suppliers to drive category growth and why it's important to Maya. For those of you not familiar with Maya, they are one of the leading grocery retailers in the US with more than 240 stores across the Midwest with headquarters in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Don started his career in the automotive industry before joining Target in 2004. And Don has now been with Maya for the last seven years in a variety of merchandising roles. Again, Don, thank you for joining. Now, despite my English accent, I'm actually an American and I have a passport to prove that. Although I did grow up in the UK, uh, hence where I got my English accent from. And my current role is leading the US business for Advantage Group International a global market research company. Uh, for those of you less familiar with it, I want to help set the stage. Uh, we've been in the business to business collaboration or supplier engagement space for 30 years now. Our US study has over three and a half thousand participants from retailers and suppliers. And through the course of that research, we also interview over a thousand people each year just in the US on how to measure performance and collaboration with their trading partners. Now, the name Advantage Group International isn't a misnomer. We actually are a global company, and we have over 35,000 retailers and CPG companies participate in our research around the world. And it's through that both US and international research that has led us to work with some of the very largest CPG companies, including P&G, as we heard, PepsiCo, Coke, Mondelez, Kimberly Clark, and many others of you who are actually uh, signed up in, in today's session. And for those of you that are not familiar with us or have seen this year's results, please do reach out to me afterwards. I'll make sure you get a copy of the work that you are doing with us so you can dive deeper into your specific uh, results. Now, combining our US strength with our international perspective has allowed us to work out really what is best in class. And again, I want to congratulate Maya on being the number one rated retailer in America by the supplier community for the fifth straight year in a row. Really a tremendous achievement. And this is why I'm so thrilled to have Maya join us today. So now you know a little bit about who's speaking. Why is the driving category growth important and why is measuring collaboration important? Well, there's about a 5% growth available to you when you collaborate with your partners. In fact, we've seen through our research that companies that are scoring lower in our collaboration study have lower financial performance the following year and companies that have strong collaboration scores in our study have better financial performance the following year. So just think about those for a company in a minute. If you could get 5% sales growth based on how you do what you do, what would that be worth to you? Would it be 10 million? Would it be 100 million? Well, I bet it's a lot. And so 
understanding how you can drive growth with your retail, how you can partner with your retail, we believe is fundamental to your overall business success. Hence the topic today around driving category growth with retailers. Now, based on our research here in the US, driving category growth with retailers is the fourth biggest predictor of your overall performance in the eyes of a retailer. And now if you talk to an executive like Don or senior management at a retailer, actually collectively, it's the third biggest driver of a supplier's overall performance. And in fact, if you're talking to Maya specifically, it's the single biggest driver of overall performance with Maya based on our statistical analysis of more than 100 Maya associates and how they evaluated their key suppliers. So just think about that for a minute. The most important thing you can do with Maya based on our research on hundreds of respondents is to demonstrate how you're driving category growth. And that's why we're absolutely thrilled to have Don share some of his thoughts about why it matters to Maya and what they are looking for from their key partners. So without further ado, Don, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Mark, for uh, the introduction. You know, before I get started, what I want to say that we take the Advantage Report extremely seriously at Meyer. And while the five years running um, is a, a great accomplishment, we're very humbled by it. Uh, we're not satisfied, so we continue to go through and take the feedback we receive from all of our vendor community and what we continue uh, to work on and what we need to do better. And we'll um, continue that this year and years going forward because our intention is to get it for the sixth year and the seventh year running and so forth. So thank you to those of you who participate in that survey. It's extremely important uh, to us here at Meyer. Um, I also want to just thank, thank Vantage and Total and everyone on this webinar for taking the time today. What is a very important topic to Meyer, as was noted, our number one driver and how we view um, our rating with our vendor community. Since I joined the foods team five years ago, we've been working each year to get better at our analysis and our partnership with the vendor community. And I like to believe we've made uh, some great strides in that area. At Meyer, we heavily invest in both name brands and the Meyer brand, but in a world where many of our competitors are solely focused only on development of house brands, we view ourselves as a house of brands offering customers greater choice. And we think that is our key differentiator in the marketplace. By being that uh, house of Brands, it demands that we collaborate with the best partners to help meet our customers' wants and needs. And I'll go through a few of what we are looking for and what really um, separates that good behavior or good uh, relationship between another. But the bottom line to me, it all comes down to relationships between the vendor community, their sales team, the category management team, and the retailers team. My personal belief is that through partnering, we can both become much more efficient with our resources and place bigger bets and take on greater risk, which is what it's all about at the end of the day. When our team meets to develop a joint business plan, we try to focus on a few key pieces to the process. The first is around strategy and initiative sharing. What is Meyer's strategy for a given business? How important is it to us? Do we view it as a growth business? Do we view it as uh, that we have greater market share opportunity? How does this category differentiate Meyer? If you're not hearing those when you come to have a discussion with the Meyer team, we would ask that you ask those questions and get that out of that team. It's critically important to the process. Similarly, we want to hear how the vendor views this business and category. How important is it to their company's overall strategy? How important is Meyer to their portfolio? Are we gaining or losing share in the category and why? Are we growing in the top segments for their accounts? Why or why not? All of these discussions allow both parties to gain insight into how much time or resources we should be putting into the business together. And I think this is where honesty is just critical. You know, we all have priorities in our organizations. And I think what really turns the needle is when we're clear on what the objectives are of each organization and align where they naturally make sense and go after them together. The second big piece is around insights. And I think this is probably one of the most critical pieces. Our team is a very small team at Maya relative to some of the larger players um, in the space that we compete. We work tirelessly to understand their business um, and we also really benefit from our partner's expertise. We want to better understand what is trending in the categories and why. Where do you see opportunities for us, for Meyer to grow, not just in your business, but in the total category? When you come meet with the Meyer team, what we're first interested in hearing is what's going on in the industry, what's going on in the business, how are we performing in the total category, not just simply with uh, the items that you may be supplying us that in that day. 
what does best in class performance in this category really look like? And I think you know many times um, we hear areas where the benchmark, but we tend to also really want to know our warts and what we can go tackle to get better. The last piece is really about taking action. And this is an area I'll tell you candidly that um, I'm pushing my team and at Meyer we're pushing the total team to get better at. I think we're good, but we want to be great at this third piece because this is where it all comes together. Align where our mutual interests and strategies intersect and just go. Sometimes these insights lead to decisions that are simply about a particular company's brand, um, but about greater actions that drive an entire category, such as a full-scale reinvention. And I think it's these big ideas that really tend to get us excited um, and really want to go after things. So come with your insights and come with some big blockbuster ideas. We, we might not say yes to all of them, but you never know where a test may lead and which ones make sense for us to both go after. Finally, I wanted to wrap up just by sharing a few tips on how to maximize your time when you meet with Meyer and the buying team. As I mentioned, um, we're a small team, right? And we focus very heavily on growth and innovation. Our intention is to be one of the top accounts for all our vendor partners that we do business with. And we want to drive growth in our in the categories where we participate in. So I'd recommend that first you visit the stores. You know, if you're new to Meyer or if you have new team members that have joined, um, our format is unlike many of the others that we compete in. We are a food-led super center versus some of the other uh, competition that it leads with GM and then uses food to drive that traffic in. We are a food-led super center and it makes our format a little more unique. Get a list of our, our different prototypes and if possible get out to them um, before you come in. Be honest, we like to hear the good and the bad opportunities. We are, um, you know, we don't get better if we don't understand uh, where our, our weaknesses are and so we want to really hear them. Be efficient. We don't have a large team, as I mentioned, and we are a fairly flat organization. Our buyers make the majority of the decisions uh, in, this, in this company. And so uh, making sure you're building relationship foundationally with the buyer and the buying team is critical um, and making sure that you're efficient with that time. Um, sharing stuff that can be done in four hours that could actually be done in one is, is not efficient for us or for yourselves. And we really greatly appreciate it when people recognize how limited uh, our team and our team's time is and make sure they come in with what's the agenda what are we all trying to accomplish that day? And what are we both hoping to walk out at the end of the day so we can be efficient with the conversation? Um, the last I'd share is really about being early in the process. Our timelines, while we are a small company, maybe relative to the space, uh, are, are no different. We have very long timelines in terms of how we build out different business models. There are many times nine months out when we're trying to talk about different promotional activity or things we want to go after. So coming in with ideas that are looking forward is really critical. If you have something you know you want to do maybe in the next year or 10 or 12 months, having that peek behind that curtain, sharing where you're going and your innovation upstream so we can be part of that dialogue really helps ensure that we can both maximize the potential and not skip a beat or not potentially miss something uh, simply because we were too late to the party. None of this is possible though without a strong partnership and trust. And uh, as a small team, we deeply value the relationships that we build between our company and the others, and they're critical to our success. And I, as I started in the beginning, to me, it's all about relationships. So thank you everybody, and I'll turn it back over to Mark. John, thank you so much for sharing. And were well, there Mark, any questions from the audience at this time? Yeah, Mark, there's a couple There's a couple questions, and I'll go ahead and read them off so that uh, Don can go ahead and answer them. Uh, the first question is, what is the biggest mistake that you see manufacturers make calling on Meyer? The biggest mistake, um, you know, I would say, and it sounds kind of odd, but we, we do see it quite a bit, is just not being prepared, right? Is coming in and not understanding our business, um, not having been in our stores. And I get we're all time crunched. Um, but sometimes we have people come in and they, they have new people on the team and they're pitching an idea or a full scale change without understanding fundamentally what's our format, what our initiatives are, um, taking the time to ask us, what are you looking to achieve? Because it, it might be a category that quite frankly, we might look at and say, hey, it's important, but this isn't an area where we're driving growth um, and you're spending a lot of time and resources and energy uh, focused in the area that is not going to yield a lot of benefit for you. So I think it's one being prepared and part of that preparation is um, making sure that you understand up front from the Meyer team, um, what are you trying to achieve and, and what areas really matter to you? Great answer. Thanks. The second question uh, is literally talking about, do you feel manufacturers 
you you mentioned before being very clear, being very concise. We've heard from a lot of retailers over surveys we've done over the last six months that that man, the manufacturers are powerpointing retailers to death. Too many slides, too much <laughs> nice information. Do you see the same thing in the calls that you're sitting in at Meyer? Yes, I do. Yeah, you know, I think that's kind of where I mentioned that, you know, don't take four hours to do what could accomplish in one, right? I think a lot of times it's great to have the detail and sometimes it's simply asking, hey, we've got a lot of information we can run through, how much industry information you need. And to me, having a summary that hits on what are the three key highlights because obviously a lot of the macro trends we all have similar research a lot of the vendor partners have a lot of similar research and we might use different words but they land in the same space so summarizing that up front and saying here's what we are seeing we're assuming you're seeing the same thing how does this impact you and then moving on to so here's how we want to leverage it and quickly i think is um the right approach for suspending you know 90 percent of the time rehashing the industry trends and not getting to what i think is the critical part the ideation and then the action that thank you that is that is what i'm hearing constantly from our retailers and surveys that we're doing with them create an executive summary don't be afraid to tell me what to do so that we can have a dialogue on what's going to help me grow you got it perfect as you guys uh, the next question was as you guys have that you guys what role do you see food brokers playing at Meyer currently and in the future as we move into you know your click and collect world and more of e-commerce yeah that's a, a fantastic question you know today um brokers for us you know play, play a, a really critical role um they offer a link especially for a lot of our vendors that don't have um the resources to have someone right here on ground right in grand rapids to part to play that um that facetime role and ensure that they're getting the information to us and back to the vendor community um, many of them are also playing roles in our stores, right? Helping out with different arms of their businesses, arms and legs to see what's going on, ensuring things are getting executed the way we expect them, helping us identify problems early on. Um, and those are also critically important. That role over time, to be candid, may, may change a bit as we are evolving our operational team to be uh, much more efficient and giving them more tools to provide us site and verification on execution because we know that's one of the pieces we need to continue to get better at uh, candidly is ensuring that everything's executed the way that we expect it to be 100% of the time. Um, and so we are pushing on our operational organization to up that portion of the game and they're, they're rising to that challenge. So that role might evolve over the next coming, call it two years or so as different tools uh, get uh, presented to our teams. Fantastic. The next question was, what data or information do you wish manufacturers would bring you more of or that you're missing currently to make better business decisions? You know, I, I think in a real simplistic terms, it would be sizing up truly and accurately the business value when we're missing an opportunity, whether that's you know as, as minor as a small set of items or as large as a, a macro trend we're not in, and really being able to um, demonstrate that factually on the monetary opportunity that is being left on the table, and then with the potential actions of what steps we could take in order to move there quickly to capture it. So literally putting a real number on whatever that opportunity is so that you can go ahead and put it in context of all the other opportunities that you have that are out there. You got it. All right, perfect. Um, the, the next question um, has to deal with um, the tire supply chain through execution at Meyer. Um, as you guys go ahead and listen to manufacturers, are manufacturers doing a good job of bringing everything from when they ship it through to execution at Meyer to make it work for you, or can they do that better? No, there's an opportunity there on both sides. Uh, quite frankly, um, the Meyer JBP process and our partnering process really is not that old. I think we've started over the last five years candidly um, and gotten better and better at it as a buying organization where we're where we're ready to take the next step, I think is inviting some of the other partners, both from our own company, our supply chain team in, as well as from our supplier partners and saying, where do we optimize this, right? Especially as costs continue to rise in different segments of the business, what could we do differently together that's gonna take cost out or speed up time to market? Um, and it is a it is a clear opportunity that uh, that we need to go after. 
Perfect. Next question is about Meyer curbside. Um, we as a CMA with the people, with the retailers that we have, we constantly hear how grocery pickup or pickup at store has been a tremendous boost for them from a loyalty standpoint and how much their shoppers love it. You guys have been immensely successful with Meyer curbside. What are a couple of the key learnings from that and how do you see that changing in the future? Yeah, curbside has been fantastic for us as, as it has been for all retailers. And we're fundamentally providing just another avenue to shop, right? And I think that is something we're going to continue to see in the marketplace um, and it's going to become just normal, just as much as uh, leveraging delivery to home has also become quickly much more of a, a norm. While a small percentage of everyone's business, it, it's growing. We expect to see both those segments continue to grow. It does drive, you know, when you provide the customer access multiple different ways to interact with your brand and to shop, it does drive greater, greater loyalty. Um, we are definitely seeing that. It allows us also to get greater insights into our own business, right? So you get much more real-time data and feedback uh, on what is the customer customers are truly seeing because we can see in stocks or out of stocks much more quickly and especially with our delivery partners we get a lot of feedback um, so it's provided uh, data two ways which have been extremely helpful all right that was all the questions that I had right now Don for you so first of all on behalf of SEMA uh, and the CMA we want to thank you and Meyer for your continued partnership over the years you guys have been a tremendous asset to us, you've been incredibly helpful. Uh, Justin's gonna come and speak at the conference again this year from an e-commerce standpoint. So we wanna say thank you and thank you for your time today. Are there any last kind of statement you wanna make before we hand it back over to Mark? No, I just again say thank you to everybody. And um, as I mentioned again, our intention is to be the sixth time running in the lead. So if there are things that we need to do better, and I know there are, and we've certainly read through the report and we've seen where we need to get better, please bring them to us. Be candid. Um, you can share them directly with our team or you know, if you've worked directly with myself or with Amanda McVeigh who runs the grocery side of the business, uh, sharing those insights and where we're not maybe um, as strong as we ought to be is critical to our success us and we want to hear it. So thank you everyone and have a fantastic morning. Don, th thank you so much. And, and Mark, as I turn it back to you, I did want to, again, talk about the reporting that you guys bring to life. And I'll just give you a real life example of how I used it during my time at Proctor. Um, we had been, you know, leaders in category management for a long time and fell by the wayside for a couple of years because of various reasons. Um, but I remember using a slide with your advantage data on the category management rankings uh, with senior management at Proctor while I was running Walmart and Sam's. And the slide was literally, what's the fastest declining brand at P&G? And everybody guessed a real brand. And then I said, actually, no, it's the category management scores that we get an advantage. And we had gone from a 64 to a 39 over a number of years. So your data is immensely helpful in outlining problems in leading to real discussions that can lead to change. So I'm gonna turn it back over to you, um, now, Mark, and let you go through the rest of the presentation. Great. Well, again, thank you, Don, so much for sharing today. Tom, thank you for that uh, that anecdote. Um, so, so let's turn now to the broader research and not just looking at what we've learned from Maya today, but what have we learned from all major U.S. retailers across many years of our research? And what are the best in class behaviors and traits we as an industry should be trying to demonstrate every day to drive category growth? Well, one thing to think about is what does misalignment look like? And that's really important to note because ultimately what we get to when we are misaligned between the retailer and the supplier is disappointment, sure, but it breaks down the relationships. As Don said, that relationships are super important to Maya, right? But they're important to most retailers. And in fact, sales then suffer, right? So we just, we heard from Tom just a minute ago, unprompted actually, that they saw their category management scores decline. That actually has a material impact on how you're doing from financial performance too. So I'll give you a real example. I was talking to a, a large CPG company, um, earlier this year and they were talking about an experience with a particular buyer where the supplier and buyer had very different objectives right and Don talked about this himself right when you come to Maya make sure we align on the objectives right don't come and pitch me something that you think is great if it doesn't align with what I'm trying to achieve well ultimately both sides are very dissatisfied and financially sales were suffering sales were down and they were certainly not keeping up with market pace well in this particular case this retailer did go through one of their traditional reorgs right we had a new buyer come in place and very quickly, the new buyer and the CPG company were able to align on what the objectives were. 
what that allowed them to do within two months of the change was they were able to start growing the category at double digits again. And in fact, they started to over index in this category with this retailer. So making sure you're well aligned and understanding your trading partner's needs isn't just a nice to have, it's a need to have in order to be able to drive the business forward. And that's when great things can happen. The number one influencer for driving category growth is providing valuable insights. In fact, Don, Don already gave me kind of a setup there where he talked about bringing good insights to Maya is really important. So again, let me say it again. The number one thing in driving category growth is providing valuable insights. It has a single biggest influence on how a retailer perceives you as a great partner. So ask yourself for a minute, and is everyone on your team and everyone back in head office are they always using insights to demonstrate why the recommendation is going to drive growth? If you cannot back up your message with data and insights, you're going to fail. And that may seem very obvious, right? But our research shows that many, many suppliers are failing to tailor that message. Again, don't rehash your corporate message, please. I can give you one piece of advice. Stop taking the corporate message and churning it back to the retailer. You have to reframe that corporate message in the needs of the retailer. What about their shoppers, their objectives, right? Otherwise, you're not delivering valuable insights. And in fact, you're not actually delivering any insights at all. But don't take my word for it. Let's see what retailers say themselves about um, partners that are delivering valuable insights. So these are real quotes from retailers talking about their very best in class suppliers. I'll let you read the comments yourselves. So again, are all of you and all your colleagues at every single retailer you do with, are you driver, delivering a fact-based approach, that impartial perspective and consistently bringing insights? If not, you're missing huge opportunities. Now, what are some of the challenges we see? So here's what not to do. Again, these are real quotes from real retailers talking about partners that were really struggling in delivering valuable insights. In fact, you may be better off not bringing any insights at all than bringing something that's put off your buyer or your merchant, right? Because why would they listen to you in the future when your competitors are coming in first time and delivering a tailored message every time they talk to that retailer? Okay. Now we've heard about impressions, everything, right? First impressions are what count. Well, impressions really are everything. And so how your retailer sees you is heavily impacted by how easy or difficult you are to work with. In fact, proactivity and objectivity are key things that we find when we unpack the providing insights. So it's not just coming in with new market research and insights, right? That in itself is interesting, but have you tailored that to be proactive in terms of driving something new versus just following what everyone's been talking about for six months or six years? And again, are you showing objectivity in that? Again, are you over promoting your brand because the, the buyer is not going to listen when you do that. You have to bring objectivity with the insights to demonstrate why it's a valuable insight and why it's going to help that retailer drive. And proactivity is a real key. In fact, something we, we specifically measure within our, our research across more than 300 suppliers, we actually benchmark how proactive you are perceived by your retail partners. And in fact, if you're talking to someone like a Don, right, an executive or senior management at a grocery mass club or value retailer, it's the single biggest driver of performance with them. So again, when you're talking to very senior executives, they're looking for proactiveness from their, their key partners. Because those very best suppliers that you're competing against for time, attention, shelf space, they're not sitting back passively, right? They are actively leaning forward, leaning in to show the retailers why they should continue to invest with that supplier over anybody else. Now, there are six best in class competencies we've learned from, again, our year's worth of research that have a, a drive overall uh, performance in driving category growth. So let's look at some of those right now and really ask yourself, are you demonstrating these behaviors each and every time you meet with your retailer? Did you have the, you have the opportunity by doing so to maximize your sales and give your company the very best chance of your recommendations be taken seriously by your retail partner? So number one, forward thinking. And I'm talking years out. Don mentioned you better plan at least nine months out to talk to Maya. But the very best suppliers are coming into their retail partners and talking about what does two, three, four years out look like. Are you doing that regularly? Because that's what best in class looks like. 
I mentioned objectivity again, it gets one of the six key behaviors that drive overall category uh, growth and performance. Are you bringing a truly objective measure? Because if not, your buyer is going to tune out and they're going to tune out for you every other meeting going forward. If you cannot bring an objective, objective message, maybe don't bring a message at all. Understand your retailer. Like Don talked about it. It is absolutely true. We see that not just with my, but with all the retailers we work with. If you don't understand your retailer, and that means have you walked their floor? Or have you shot their website? Do you understand what their objectives are for the category? Well, that category may be important to you. It may not be their number one driver. And so really making sure you understand where they're at, because when you fail and you demonstrate you don't understand your retailer, it has a long term negative impact on how they perceive you. And therefore, every single future pitch you're trying to make is colored by that. Well, they don't really know what they're talking about. They don't understand me and my business and who my shopper is. Again, it may seem so obvious, but it's amazing how we see supplier after supplier failing to fully demonstrate you understand your unique retailer. Now, the next competency is using data. It's absolutely critical to come in, not with your personal opinion, but with some form of data set to demonstrate why this is a true, uh, true insight, a true value proposition. Uh, Don talked about it, right, again, in his piece. When you go in, you know, value the size of the prize. Don't say, oh, here's an interesting trend. Here's an interesting trend, and I think it could be worth X dollars, right? If you can use data and put a value around it, it becomes a much more appealing message. And again, very best in class suppliers are doing this right now and every day and have been for a while. Also, what's critically important is having highly skilled analysts. Again, we're all looking for, you know, obviously data scientists at a more senior level, but everyone needs to be comfortable with analyzing data and talking about data because the very best suppliers, the ones that are driving the business faster, are coming with very good analytics and insights. So now we've learned about these competencies, what do they really mean? How does a retailer describe a supplier that is forward thinking? So let's look at some interview comments to give you real examples of what you should be looking to demonstrate and emulate. Oh, I forgot one more turning insights into action, right? Ultimately, again, putting a value around it, driving forward with a recommendation. So competency one, forward thinking. I'll let you read the slide. We hear the word new innovation. I've heard from people use the word real innovation. We see complaints time and time again from retailers about suppliers bringing in line extensions. A new flavor, color, size, it's not going to cut it. Now, as an account manager, it's not your fault, but you need to go back to corporate innovation and talk to them about the Me Too products and the line extensions, because they will not cut it with a retailer. You're not gonna really drive tremendous category growth if it's a Me Too. Retailers don't see that as innovation, Competency too, about demonstrating an objectivity or an unbiased approach. Again, if you fail to be see, if you fail to be perceived as objective, your recommendations are going to fall on deaf ears. Now, don't let all your hard work fall short in the last hurdle by giving the retailer the impression that you are self-serving. Suppliers that are perceived as being unbiased have the greatest chance of their ideas and recommendations being accepted, which of course is what you want. Let me put it another this way, very harshly. Nobody cares about you. Right, I said it, nobody cares about you. They care about what you can do for them. So if you reframe your message in terms of how it's gonna help that company, that buyer, right? You're off for a winning argument. So again, really ask yourself every time are you going in about what's in it for them, or are you trying to position it what's in it for you? The third competency is about again, understanding the business. And I've already said about no one cares about you, but have you positioned your ideas around the retail's objective? If not, you're doomed to fail. Are you taking your company's objectives and reframing and applying them through that retailer's lens? And this is how one retailer described it. But ask yourself, are we always making that connection? Are we always aligning to our retailer's objectives or are we sending the corporate line? Competency for is about using data. Again, this is a real quote from a retailer about how they describe a best in class partner. So you have to use facts, not opinions to justify your position. 
We know it's not always easy or cheap to access data, but having real data well analyzed will dramatically improve the quality of your argument. Now look, we fully acknowledge that some retailers are not great at sharing data, right? We all know who they are. In fact, some want to charge you for data. It may seem impractical. And certainly uh, some suppliers feel it, it may not be practical to, to pursue that. Now, we also work with retailers to encourage them to be more free in their data sharing because we understand the power of sharing data and using it to drive category growth. But regardless of your retailer's policy about sharing data or not, you should use data in your pitches to help demonstrate why your idea is a solid recommendation. So competency five is around having a highly skilled uh, analyst team. It's self-explanatory, right? So I'm not gonna, I'll let you read the quote. Notice the word take initiative here. Are you being proactive? Are you putting the right resources against the account? Think about it for a minute. If we could raise the bar by 2% with our particular customer, what would that be worth to us? And should we therefore be considering applying a different set of resources to justify further growth? Now, competency six, the last one, was around translating it into action. If you cannot communicate your message in a clear with recommended actions, the retailer will not be comfortable with your recommendations. Having a plan to address the business issues is your opportunity to drive retailer confidence and confidence ultimately leads to action. So, how do we align on the category objectives? Well, these six behaviors may seem very simple and obvious, but I can tell you they're not because our research shows most companies are not excelling in this space. In fact, most companies are, are barely making, meaning the bare minimum. So ask yourself, are we doing this all the time with all our retailers? Now, how do you measure yourself against your competitors? More importantly, against best in class suppliers who truly understand where opportunities lies. Are you hearing back from one person uh, when you get feedback or you're hearing from multiple people? And look, I often hear from suppliers who say, my retailer says I'm doing fine. Well, what does fine mean? Let me break that down. Fine probably means you're average. So ask yourself, do you want to be average? I bet you don't. In fact, fine may mean you're running 100 miles an hour, but if your competition's running 101, you're still last. Now, what advantage is seen through our research in the US and around the world, again, is that higher scores in collaboration can achieve about a 5% better sales performance in the following year, i.e. we're a predictive measure of performance based on how you perform. Now, in a case by base cases, we have seen suppliers achieve double digit sales performance based on taking um, addressable feedback and moving the needle forward from being average to excelling. So here's your homework from today's session. It's a lot, but it's a very simple one pager. And I really encourage all of you to take it, print it out and share it with all your colleagues. It's a checklist about what to do um, and how to encourage your team to really self-assess, I'll be demonstrating these behaviors and traits all day. So think how much more you can sell and how much more fun and enjoyable your job's gonna be if each day you're demonstrating these world-class behaviors, focusing on driving category growth. That's always much more fun to be in a growing business. Your retailer's gonna thank you and you'll find your maximum category growth for your retailer and your company. So I want to end it there. Thank you for your time and open up to any questions the audience might have. And Mark, thank you so much. Here's the first question. What's an interesting tidbit or information you've learned from one of your more recent surveys? Sure. Well, for me, I found it very interesting that trust is the single biggest driver of performance with a retailer. In fact, it's the number one driver around the world with retailers. And trust may seem somewhat obvious, right? Of course, they must trust us and want to work with us. But how many of you today are actually measuring trust? Well, actually, you know, we are, but most of you probably don't even measure trust. It's probably not one of your KPIs, right? Today you might have KPIs around delivery on time or what is your sales report, but are you measuring trust? It's absolutely fundamental and foundational to your relationships and how you can sell them to a retailer. And there are various behaviors and steps that go underneath that that drive trust. That's a whole separate presentation I won't be able to get into today, but um, that's the single biggest learning for me is 
is measuring and building trust is absolutely critical. Perfect. From the survey, what are the important areas to focus on in 2019 from your retailers? We talked, you know, driving category growth is, is absolutely critical. If we look at kind of bigger picture, it's things we already know about, right? E-commerce clearly continues to be critical for suppliers and retailers. Profitable e-commerce growth is kind of, I think, the new is going to be the new catchphrase, right? We don't just want to grow any commerce; we actually want to make money or at least break even. And my advice is look at markets like the UK or China. They're really at the forefront of e-commerce, particularly grocery e-commerce. If you think about what Kroger is doing right now with Ocado, there's a conscious reason why they're partnering with those guys. Their technology is, is very impressive. But think about how we help, you know, delivery, as Don mentioned, curbside pickup, that whole space is, is going. We clearly see fresh and private label being points of differentiation that many retailers believe is going to help them win against those pure play e-commerce retailers. Um, and if you're in center store, I really encourage you to think, talk about what I said earlier. Think about real innovation, not line extensions, right? Um, that's where you're really going to start to win and drive drive real real growth in your business. Right. Mark, can you go back to the homework slide for a second? And as, you go, and as you go back to it, we had a question on, what have you heard from retailers about how they're thinking about the future of shelf space in stores as online continues to grow? And I didn't know if you had any insight from that. This is going to be Mark's personal opinion versus anything I would say is pure hard research. Um, but clearly all retailers continue to look at shelf space. Again, I'll, I'll use the UK example, even though I haven't lived there for 16 years. It's a great example of a, a kind of more forward thinking market. Uh, many retailers are, you know, reducing shelf space in store and, and using, you know, back end, uh, closing down part of the store to use it for, for curbside pickup and delivery. Uh, clearly, we see all retailers have been pushing fresh for a number of years now. We only think that will continue as more consumers want this healthy lifestyle. And so I think the overall shelf space will continue to shrink. I've read studies that say there's just too much shelf space in the US right now. Um, but I don't think that necessarily is a, a negative for a, um, a supplier, because if we think about the macroeconomic level, right, the American consumer is still here. We don't have a declining population. So the demand is there. How we service that demand may be shifting between online and off. But I don't think we should be scared of that shift. We should just say, how do we get our product in the right place in the right time? I think that's a, you know, that's a great insight. And as I look at your checklist, you know, for on both sides, one and two, incredibly helpful for people in our industry to follow these. And I especially love, right, as you take a look at, are your insights presented in a clear way with the right balance of relevant information, right? It, so many times, as Don highlighted, we need to come with an executive summary, decks of data, and we need to clearly provide our insights so that people can go ahead and make action on them quickly. So your checklist is a great reminder of what's important as we call on retail customers. Another question came in on any feedback on retailers, how to work with those and try to go ahead and get more data from them who aren't providing data or giving additional information that can help you help them manage a category better. Any tips or tricks for that? I wish there was an easy answer. It is challenging, right? There, is, there are certain companies that have a culture of sharing, and there are certain companies that have a culture of not sharing. Um, I, I can tell you, and, and I meet with lots of retailers every year, we are regularly reminding certain retailers that they need to share more um, because we firmly believe that those that share more have much better uh, sales and performance than those that don't share. And the few dollars you might make from selling data is not nearly as much as you'd make by actually selling more products. Uh, in terms of a tip, I would just go back to the, and remind them, the retailer, hey, this is important to me. I think if I had access to X, I could find efficiencies for you. So again, spin it you know, or position it in a way that helps demonstrate why you're gonna drive value for that retailer, right? As opposed to, I need more data. If I had access to X, I think I could help you drive Y performance. I think we could you know, improve our in-stock rate or reduce our inefficiencies in the supply chain system. That, that's my only recommendation. Fantastic. We had a specific question to check out and didn't know if you had done any survey results or had gotten any feedback checkout wise. As we all know, checkout has become more and more competitive in terms of all the items that want to be up there, in terms of the structure for what retailers want, and also in a grocery pickup world, right? The checkout is actually done online now instead of there. Any 
advice to suppliers in that ever increasing competitive area of checkout on what to do to better meet retailer needs? So it's a challenge, right? As we, we discussed, a lot of it is going to online, right? And so that impulse opportunity in some ways is diminished. Having said that, I saw an interesting presentation from Mercado UK last year, which is the largest e-commerce grocery retailer in the UK. And they don't feel that they suffer in any way from having that because of how they built their website and kind of promote, we'll call it promote those um, impulse opportunities online. Obviously, if you're not doing curbside pickup, but you know, consumers coming in to the lockers or, or to inside the store to collect their items, how you then build those bins or how you build those lockers is an opportunity to put impulse items around that. And so while the consumer's in there picking up his or her groceries, would she buy a bottle of beverage, right? Would she buy a, a salty snack or a confectionery item? Yeah, that is a, that is a great point, Mark. And, and that was our last question. So I'll open it for any final questions. Please type them in now. Um, the, the other thing we see a bunch of manufacturers working on um, now from an impulse and checkout perspective is how do you do that online? How do you, how do you create the ability knowing your shopper for them to order one or two of those things that would have been triggered right during checkout, whether that is a, right, a drink or a candy bar or batteries, something along those lines. We're seeing more and more retailers work with their partners to go ahead and try to drive purchase that way. So that's another area that I think people should explore for how do you go ahead and do that and create banners to add something additional to a basket before it gets checked out. Right, and one, one thing I did hear from Ocado, it's not necessarily about impulse, but about trial and repeat, is what Ocado does through its partnership with several suppliers is at the end of the checkout, they'll say, oh, thank you, you spent so much money we will offer you this free item. And that free item really is a way for a supplier to get trial of a new product. Um, and so that can be another vehicle to kind of, you know, uh, get items in front of consumers by offering it as a, a freebie. And then hopefully yeah. they add that to the cart down the road. Yeah, great, great example. All right, well, uh, we, uh, we don't have any further questions. I would love to, uh, Mark, just commend you on a, a, a great webinar full of helpful information for, the, for our attendees and for our members to keep in mind and follow as they approach 2019, both calling on retailers and accepting um, presentations from manufacturers on what is needed. I thought you and Don did an excellent job of outlining uh, what needs to occur in our industry to make more fact-based presentations and how important insights are. Your information is on the slide now. Um, for anyone who needs to reach out, you can of course come through us at the CMA or go directly to Mark. Um, but this and what Advantage does is incredibly helpful if you can incorporate those metrics and measures into your business. So Mark, any last comments from you? I just want to thank everyone for their time today. If there are any questions, you can reach me on this page. And I, again, just to reiterate what was said earlier, uh, both the presentation and the recording will be made available uh, on the website. And so um, thank you so much for your time today and happy holidays. Mark, thanks so much. Everyone, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. We will see you in the new year. Take care.